I am the male half of a married couple, Dirk and Gretchen Van V. Lyatt. We are both 42 years old, tall, slim, blonde with blue eyes, which is not surprising given our Dutch origins. I don't know how our Indian and African-American friends rate us, but among our Caucasian friends, we are probably considered an 8 out of 10 on the attractiveness scale. We have three children, two boys, Jurgen, 18 years old, and Finn, 14 years old, and one girl, Tess, 16 years old. They are all tall, blonde with blue eyes. They are the joy of my life, and I'm sure Gretchen's joy too. Our marriage was, for lack of a better word, comfortable. We got along, rarely quarreled, and had similar political views and ideas for raising children. We believed in setting rules and always following them, unless there was a very good reason for exception, and in giving children all the love, attention, and support without spoiling them. I believe this has worked well with our children, as they are all well-adjusted, kind but determined and ambitious. Gretchen is a successful commercial real estate agent and I am a managing quality assurance engineer for a company that started out as a startup when I started working there and is now a large multinational corporation. We have no financial problems and live in a beautiful home in the suburbs of Washington, Virginia. Gretchen's sex life, or at least mine, was also comfortable. We had quality sex on average twice a week, more often on vacation or when the kids were away from home for long periods of time. It was more love than sex, unlike my life before I met Gretchen. Before I met Gretchen, when we were both 22, I was a big ladies' man. We got married 18 months after we met. Before Gretchen, I had only had one serious relationship that lasted more than a month or two, and that was with Gina Martinelli when I was 20 years old, between my sophomore and junior years of college. Gina couldn't be more different from Gretchen. Gina is a petite Italian girl. 100 pounds with wet hair. I'm over a foot taller than her, and her olive skin contrasts sharply with my snow-white skin. At the time, Gina was 29 years old, recently divorced, and had two young children. She was as volatile as Gretchen and I were calm. Gina and I met when I pulled into her car in a mall parking lot the day after my last exam. It's a miracle we even got together because she was so angry that I damaged her car that if her kids hadn't been with her, I think she would have hit me with a tire iron. I gave her all my contact information, drove with her to the repair shop, and told her I was in charge of the repairs, and then drove her and her kids home, which calmed her down. I couldn't help but stare at her shapely hips jutting out from under her short skirt as I drove her home, and she clearly noticed and smiled. Exactly how we got together and how one thing led to another, I won't say for sure, but three days after I crashed into her car, we were having sex like rabbits, and two weeks later I moved into her small house for the summer, telling his parents that he had found a better summer job elsewhere. Although Gina was sweet, sexy, smart, and, as mentioned, volatile, her most outstanding qualities were her passion and sexual intensity. This woman could have sex like no other in my experience, and she wanted it all the time. There was nothing that would not cause injury or illness that was not available. We did this at least once a day, usually three times for the entire three months of the summer that I lived with her. Even when she was on her period, we made love in the shower or outside and never missed a day. Gina also came to stay with me on four weekends over the next two months while I was in college, leaving her children with her parents and little sister, who were only too happy to babysit. Neither Gina nor I ever saw our relationship as leading to marriage. It wasn't just the age difference and having two children, but our personalities didn't mesh and her heritage was important to her and her family. The last time she visited me in college, on the Sunday night before she left, she told me that she had met a rich, older, Italian man named Vince Aliotto who was crazy about her, and whom her parents approved of. Although I was sad, Gina gave me an unforgettable experience that will likely never be topped. Gina and I had sex so many times in the five months of our relationship that I think Gretchen and I were married a year before the number of all the other times I had sex in my life with other partners reached the number of times we did it with Gina. There was really no reason why I should have been in the lobby of the W Hotel in Washington, D.C. on a Tuesday afternoon in May, 
but an unexpected request from a good client who was staying there before a trip to Europe led me to this place. Imagine my surprise when I saw Gretchen coming out of the elevator, arm in arm with a man with brown hair and brown eyes, about her height and age. Gretchen was too busy with her companion to look back. When I asked the front desk to call my client's number, I secretly watched Gretchen and her friend. Their parting kiss and glance, and his quick pinch of her curvy ass, were passionate. Although I'm usually calm, I felt almost as volatile as Gina, and it took all my self-control not to beat up Gretchen's lover and throw her out the window, especially after my client called my name as he exited the elevator. What's wrong, Dirk? You look like you've seen a ghost. Oh, uh, sorry, Jack. I thought I saw an old enemy from college that I never got even with, and it boiled my blood for a moment. But I just realized it wasn't him, so I'll be my normal calm self again in a few seconds, I replied, trying to smile. Jack chuckled, and we chatted for a bit, and then went to a cafe to discuss our business. I managed to focus on Jack's question, but when I left the hotel and drove back to the office, I almost got into an accident several times because I was too excited by what I saw. I only had one thing to do in the office and was able to take some time to think. I rarely act impulsively, and in such an important matter there was no reason to violate this principle, even though it was the most emotional experience in my memory. By the time I left the office at 6 p.m. to pick Tess up from tennis practice at school, I realized I needed more time to figure out what to do so I had to take a fake business trip. My warm welcome from my sweet, bubbly, beautiful daughter Tess temporarily lifted my spirits, especially as she gushed about everything that had happened that day as we drove home. It also made me realize that no matter what, I must maintain daily contact with my children. I will never be able to be a father only on weekends. Judging by her glances to the side when I got home, Gretchen probably knew I had some kind of problem but the excited and pleasant dinner conversations with the kids seemed to ease her suspicions and give me time to calm my nerves. By the time we went to bed, everything seemed fine. Luckily, Gretchen wasn't looking for sex that night, or more than the usual amount of cuddling and touching, otherwise I might have exploded. I called Gretchen on her cell phone as soon as I arrived at work Wednesday morning and told her about my surprise trip out of town. I told her that I would go home to get my things and call her and the children on my cell phone in the evening. I spent Wednesday and Thursday evenings at one of our company's several apartments in Arlington, Virginia, talking with Gretchen and the kids for about an hour each evening. By mid-afternoon Friday the day I was supposed to return from my business trip, I had figured out what I needed to do. While I did deal with some business issues on Wednesday Friday, I mostly spent time researching different ways my situation could be handled. The research included consultations with a family law attorney and a tax attorney, meetings with two different private investigation firms, a telephone conversation with a psychologist, a meeting with a medical laboratory, and a disgraced pharmacist with whom one of the laboratory's employees sometimes worked, a meeting with an international banker, and all sorts of internet research explorations from the strange to the mundane to the sublime. The main takeaway was that I needed to save my marriage until 14-year-old Finn went off to college. One of the things that really helped in this situation was that Gretchen had developed an addiction to sherry and would often drink a three-hours shot after dinner or before bed, including almost every Friday and Saturday before we went to bed. The main things I needed to do in the next four-plus years before Finn went to college included saving money, getting a private investigator's report, getting DNA tests done on my kids, pre-paying my kids' college tuition, working with a disgraced pharmacist on developing a special connection, and preparing all documents for a future divorce. Those actions also included persuading Gretchen to agree to file separate tax returns starting the next tax season, on the advice of my tax advisor due to changed circumstances at my job. With my mind free of troubles, I was able to have an almost normal sexual relationship with Gretchen over the next month. During this time, I was awaiting the report from the private investigator, the results of the DNA testing, and the completion of the compound from the pharmacist. I didn't want this to happen in less than a month because once I got some information, 
I might not be able to act normally around Gretchen, and that was something that was extremely important to me to do. Regarding DNA testing, I knew that the man I saw with Gretchen most likely could not be the father of one of my children, since he had brown eyes and hair and was not taller than Gretchen. Also, none of my children were like him. In fact, all three children really looked like a combination of Gretchen and me, so I didn't expect the DNA testing results to show anything negative, but they were needed anyway. However, what I didn't want to know was if one or more of the children were not biologically mine, so I did DNA testing in an unusual way. I didn't label the three vials containing the children's DNA samples and deliberately mixed them up so I wouldn't know which was which when I handed them over to the lab. I labeled my bottle, hash one. I simply asked the lab to find out if there is a connection between the person whose DNA is in vial hash one and those in the other three vials, and if so, what the connection is. I also told the lab that they should not indicate the sex of the individuals in the three unlabeled vials in their report. Luckily, I did just that, because almost exactly a month after I submitted my samples, and the day before I was scheduled to visit the private investigator and get her report, the lab's chief technician called me. Dirk, I have the results of the DNA tests. Okay, just in time. Let's get straight to the point, then all the comments, I replied. Of course. Note that we have arbitrarily, just for convenience, designated the three unlabeled vials as A, B, and C, and per your instructions, we have not recorded the results by sex of these individuals. The individuals corresponding to vials A and C are definitely biologically related to the individual in vial hash 1. Most likely, the individual in vial hash 1, since we determined his gender and is male, is the father of the individuals in vials A and C, Tom said. At this point, I swallowed and asked hesitantly, what about bottle B? Well, while the individual in vial B shares several alleles with the individual in vial hash 1 and is biologically related to the individuals in vial A and C, the individual in vial B is not related in any way to the individual in vial hash 1. While they may share similarities, such as hair and eye color, there is no way that the person matching vial B is a close relative of the person matching vial hash 1, Tom continued. What do you mean close relative? I stuttered. This means that the person matching bottle B cannot be the parent, grandparent, child, grandchild, aunt, uncle, nephew, niece, or first or second generation cousin of the person matching bottle hash one, Tom explained. This was a clear relief, as my father, brother, and one of my cousins were very much like me. My last question is, what is the probability that at least one of the parents of a person matching bottle B had brown hair and eyes? I asked. Tom grinned. The probability is about 1%. Thank you very much, Tom. I trust that you will send your report to my work address and that there will be no information about the gender of the individuals corresponding to vials a C, I replied. You're right. Also, the cash you gave me with instructions to keep going covers everything in fact. We can get $1.50 back so I don't need anything more, Tom replied. Leave $1.50 with my thanks. I chuckled, despite the fact that I was far from happy. I now knew that one of my children was not biologically mine, but probably had a biological father with blonde hair and blue eyes. I didn't know which child it was, and I deliberately made sure I didn't find out, because I didn't want to have the opportunity to subconsciously treat any of them differently. Having known them for at least fourteen years each, and never suspecting anything from their appearance, I didn't even try to guess and could not guess correctly even if I tried. The results also meant that, in addition to the man I saw with Gretchen, she had at least one other relationship with the biological father of one of my children. Information from the DNA laboratory almost made information from the private investigator redundant on some issues, but not on others. As expected, Judy James, the senior private investigator assigned to my case, uncovered the details of Gretchen's current affair. Judy was very professional, providing me with a verbal report before handing me the complete dossier she had compiled. The man's name is Winston Tangren. He is 41 years old, lives in New Jersey, has been married for 20 years, and has two 15-year-old twin daughters. 
He works in commercial real estate, and that is how he and your wife met. In the month that we have been with them, they met twice in hotel rooms, at the Hilton Hotel in Rockville, Maryland, and another in Springfield, Virginia. In both cases, they were in the hotel room for about two hours, give or take fifteen minutes, and apparently recently, showered when they left. They were very tactile with each other and exchanged passionate goodbye kisses and hugs. In Rockville, it was on Tuesday between about noon and two o'clock in the afternoon, in Springfield on Wednesday between about two and four o'clock in the afternoon. They left in different cars, Judy said. Have you been able to find out how long this has been going on? I asked. We can't be sure of this. However, we do know that they met almost exactly a year ago, and one paid informant, the only person who seems to suspect their affair, suggests that it has been going on for about six months. Judy answered. I nodded my head sadly. There is one thing in our written report which, for reasons I cannot explain, is greatly understated, and I will deny having told you this if I am called upon to repeat it later, she said with a smile. I listened carefully as she continued. In the report, we indicate that the investigator may, although he is not sure because obtaining phone records would be illegal, determine that Gretchen has a second cell phone with a number 571-555-XXXX, which she uses to communicate with Tanrin and perhaps with others. Again, I can't tell you why, but maybe is a gross understatement. This caught my attention. I simply nodded in appreciation. I can tell you more, but all the information I have is in the dossier, and photographs are included. Is anything more needed? Judy continued. No, that's all. Do I owe anything on top of the fee? Dollar three hundred eight forty, she replied, handing me the bill. You're quite accurate, aren't you? I chuckled, handing her three hundreds and a ten. Buy yourself a cup of coffee with your change, I smiled. Thank you, generous, she smiled back. The disgraced pharmacist was delighted to receive my assignment. I did not give him my real name and only used a burner phone to communicate with him, except for our first meeting and one meeting the day after visiting a private investigator. The challenge I gave him was to develop a drug that would be indistinguishable from sherry, would be highly sexually relaxing to the drinker, but would disappear completely after eight hours without any long-term side effects. This guy was a con artist, but also a very skilled chemist. It's obvious he really put effort into this project. So what do you have for me, Mr. Son? I asked him. I have four possible connections. You should experiment to find out which one is best, and when you find it, I will make more for you, he replied. Great, I replied. Describe them to me, please. The first, which I call Alpha, is based primarily on Mucuna beans. It contains high concentrations of L-DOPA, which produces dopamine in the body. It is enhanced by very small amounts, I repeat, small amounts, not enough to cause harm MDMA, which releases serotonin and norpinephrine. I mitigated any side effects of MDMA by adding a version of pycnogenol, which, in addition to mitigating the side effects of MDMA, has an aphrodisiac effect on women. How should I administer it, and how much? I asked. Mr. Son pulled out a small dropper bottle, just two drops, three at the most, directly into the glass before pouring the sherry, a gentle stir with a metal spoon, and you've got it. It will take effect in about 30 minutes, and the effect will be complete in 45 minutes and will last for several hours. Okay, I nodded. What else? Mr. Purtson went on to describe three other compounds, none of which sounded as promising as Alpha and all of which, even though he was downplaying them, could have real side effects. He assured me several times that Alpha would not have any side effects. When he finished his show, I paid him the rest of the amount in cash, and he told me the price of Alf's next purchase. How much Alpha will I need to buy to last me four and a half years? I asked. Leader, was his answer. Will it get worse over time? Absolutely not. The ingredients and carrier are very stable. You should shake the container once a week or so, but nothing more. If I buy a liter next time, how much will it cost? Dollar five thousand was his quick response. We shook hands and I left. 
Alpha worked so well that I didn't even try other compounds. On Saturday night, after returning from a party, I offered Gretchen a glass of sherry, which she readily accepted, with two drops of Alpha in it. I pretended to drink sherry too. After we showered separately and got ready for bed, Gretchen was very playful. We ended up having wonderful sex, and for me it was no longer love, but pure, undiluted sex. By the sixth time I gave Gretchen Alpha Sherry, I increased the dose to three drops and bought a sex toy. I purchased a liter of Alpha from Mr. Demonson, and within six months of first introducing it to Gretchen, she became much more open to various types of sexual activity. Our frequency has also increased from twice a week. I didn't give her Alpha in Sherry every night, but every night when I wanted sex. During this time, during a trip to her office, when I knew that she would not be there and told her secretary that I wanted to leave her flowers, I found her secret cell phone in the desk drawer and installed a bug on it so that I could read everything her text messages and listen to voice messages on her work computer. This way I was able to find out when she would be meeting with Tanrin. This happened on average once every two weeks. On those nights when she had to meet Tanrin the next day, I always gave her alpha, and even if she sometimes protested against sex, I didn't take no for an answer. About three months after I started figuring out when she was going out with Tanrin and following my tactics of exhausting sex, she stopped communicating with him. I assumed the affair ended then. Of course, this didn't change the way I was going to act in the future, she just became even more receptive to sexual gymnastics after that. During the four plus years that I thought I was living with an easy to get girl with whom I only had sex and never made love, I followed the rest of my plan. I got Gretchen to file separate tax returns the last few years, prepaid our kids' college tuition, even though it temporarily strained us a little financially, placed bonuses and salary increases in an offshore account from which I paid taxes in the U.S., accumulated over $100,000 in cash and pretended to have significant casino losses when he traveled to Las Vegas for a once-a-year convention, although that money also went into an offshore account. During this time, I never even tried to guess which of my three children wasn't my biological child, and continued to have a great relationship with all three, perhaps even better than the Jurgen and Finn I had with Tess. Tess never hesitated to seek my advice on any matter. In fact, she addressed me much more often than Gretchen which seemed to irritate Gretchen slightly. Finally, the day came, a Saturday, when Finn was leaving for college, about four and a half years after I learned about Gretchen's affair and that one of my children had a different biological father. We rented the largest SUV available, removed all but three of the seats, and loaded up his stuff to take him to college. I promised him a car his junior year if his first-year grades were B-plus or better, the same offer I made to Jurgen and Tess, both of whom held up their end of the deal. Finn went to James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia, about two and a half hours from our home in Northern Virginia. James Madison University has an excellent business management school, which is what interested Finn. I made sure to shake Gretchen one last time the night before. We both got up the next day, barely walking and almost mumbling. That was the last time I had sex with her. We dropped Finn off at his dorm. He was enthusiastic to see two cute girls in the room across from his around 5 p.m. to head back to Northern Virginia. I made the call to confirm that by that time, all the things I wanted to pick up from our house, the ones I hadn't gotten around to picking up myself in the last two weeks, were in my new apartment, about two blocks from my office. I texted the bailiff to confirm that we would be at the first exit into Woodstock on Route 81 in 45 minutes. As we stopped on the way out, ostensibly to gas up the car and make a restroom stop, while Gretchen went to the ladies' room, I looked around for the bailiff. The bailiff was one step ahead of me. He sent me a message indicating where he was no more than 20 meters from me. We exchanged glances, and I nodded toward Gretchen as she entered the mall. He nodded in response, and I got into the SUV and drove away. I stopped at the next exit to really fill up the car and make a restroom stop, ignoring five calls with Gretchen's distinctive ringtone. I headed straight to my apartment and had a good night's sleep on Saturday and Sunday. To say that Gretchen was furious would be an understatement. 
I knew I would have to talk to her sooner or later, so when she called my office Monday morning, I answered. She started screaming at me. I hung up. She called back, and before she said anything, I said loudly into the phone, If you yell at me, I'll hang up. If you can control your anger, I'll make an appointment. Although she was still obviously angry, she did not scream. You're such a bastard, leaving me 90 miles from home and sending a bailiff to serve me with divorce papers. What's your problem? My problem is my unfaithful wife. I can meet you tomorrow to discuss it if you want, I replied calmly. She was stunned for a second. I never. She began to speak. I interrupted her. Gretchen, don't lie to me like you've been doing for at least the last 19 years. I said we could talk tomorrow. I'm offering the conference room in your office at six in the evening. Why not our house? She asked. You mean your house? Sorry, I have too many bad memories of that place, living with a cheating wife and all. If you want to talk, it will be in the conference room of your office. Just send me a message indicating which I ended the conversation sarcastically. At exactly 6 p.m. on Tuesday, I walked into conference room B in Gretchen's office. A man in a suit sat next to her. Before I said anything, I looked at him and asked, Who the hell are you and why are you here? Can we start without any harsh words? Gretchen asked. Of course, as soon as you tell me who this man is and why he is here. My name is Dr. Bizajan Bellows, and I'm a marriage counselor, and Gretchen has asked me to attend your conversation, he said, standing up and offering me his hand. I refuse to shake it. Okay, Dr. Bellows, marriage counselor, if Gretchen wants you to stay, it's no problem for me as long as you sign a confidentiality agreement, I replied, sitting down across from him and Gretchen. This is not necessary because according to the ethical standards of my profession, he began to speak before I interrupted him again. Sorry, buddy. But either you sign a confidentiality agreement, you leave, or I leave, I said sharply. But I don't have one. He began before I interrupted him again. I come across confidentiality agreements frequently in my work, and I even had two in my briefcase because I always carry them with me along with a number of other forms. No problem, I chuckled. I pulled out one of our standard confidentiality agreements, spent five minutes correcting it in pen for our situation, and then said, Here, look, if you sign and date it, Gretchen and I will sign too, and then ask my soon-to-be ex to do copies for each of us. I saw that Gretchen was seething with anger, but for now she kept herself under control, and both she and Bellows read the agreement. Not too onerous, Bellows said. He signed it, gave it to Gretchen, who also signed it, and then I signed it. Gretchen made copies for herself and Bellows and returned the original to me. Thank you, I said, returning the document to my briefcase. Okay, now what did you want to talk about, Gretchen? I thought everything was clear in the divorce papers you were served. First of all, I want you to apologize for calling me a cheating bitch on the phone, she said sharply, crossing her arms over her chest. I surprised her when I said, Okay, I'm sorry. Although you're unfaithful and probably fit the definition of a corrupt bitch too, there was no reason to use such language in a conversation with you. From now on, if I address you on the third face, and not by name, I will use the term unfaithful spouse. How do you like that? I received some empty words from Bellows and Gretchen, which I politely responded to before Gretchen said, If you think I was unfaithful, why didn't you file for divorce on grounds of adultery? The first reason is that I lived with you for more than four years after the adultery that I know about, and therefore the court in Virginia will not accept this as a basis. Of course, there may be a more recent affair that I do not know about, but I can find out to change the grounds for divorce. But I choose not to because of the second reason is that I don't want to expose you to the consequences if our family and friends, especially Jurgen, Tess and Finn, find out about yours. Novels. You're taking your time filing because you don't meet Virginia's standard for a no-fault divorce, Bellows interjected. Technically correct, Bellows, but my lawyer assures me that by stating that since the filing of the application, which was Saturday, I have legally established a separate residence, 
the court will ignore this technicality, I replied. What evidence do you have of your cruel accusation of infidelity? Bellows then asked. Apparently, they decided it would be better to ask him some questions. With that, I pulled out an envelope from my briefcase, which contained photos of several passionate kisses between Tanrin and Gretchen, photos of them leaving their hotel rooms, text messages between them, and a brief report from a private investigator. As they looked through them, I casually remarked, By the way, Gretchen, so it doesn't come as a surprise to you, the full package of what I gave you was given to Melissa Tanrin today. Gretchen gave me a look that was a combination of horror and anger, and continued to look at my evidence. The contents of my envelope obviously knocked some of Bellows's arrogance out of him, but he continued, It's obvious that you have forgiven Gretchen, since you've been living with her for the past four-plus years, she hasn't dated Tanrin in over three years, and you've had, according to Gretchen, an improved love relationship over the past four-plus years. That's where you're wrong, doctor, I replied with a smile. I haven't made love to her since I saw her kissing and hugging Tanrin at the W Hotel in Washington, D.C. in May over four years ago. This earned a shocked look and a frown from Gretchen. I continued with pleasure. From then on I had a bitch who was a good piece. I never made love to her again. With these words, Gretchen began to cry, stood up and left the room. Bellows said, If you'll excuse us for a couple of minutes, please don't leave. I'll try to get her back, before chasing after her. I waited another fifteen minutes and was about to pack my things and leave when they returned to the room. Gretchen's eyes were red, but she was no longer crying. Sitting down, she said in a choked voice, I have loved you all our married life. Why can't you forgive me? Having an affair with Tanran was a big mistake. I will never have any relationship with anyone again. Well, the problem here is that there was at least one other affair that I know of that happened at least 19 years ago. I don't know when it started or when, or even if, it ended. This one that really bothers me and that I can't deal with, I answered through gritted teeth. I don't know what you're talking about, Gretchen sobbed. When I met Gretchen, I had absolutely no intention of telling her that I knew one of the children was not my biological one. Maybe she didn't even know, although she knew she had other connections. I knew, looking into her eyes, that things could get messy and costly if she didn't realize the depth of my disgust for her. An idea came to mind. Okay, let's do this. We'll add a clause to our confidentiality agreement that if you, Gretchen, ever tell anyone what I'm about to reveal to you with Bellows as a witness, who is also bound by confidentiality, you will pay I need a million dollars. Agreed? He and Bellows whispered for a while. Okay, she said. I took out the original agreement and added the clause. Both Gretchen and Bellows signed and dated it under the additional clause, as did I. Gretchen made copies for herself and Bellows and returned the original to me. Okay, what's the big secret? Gretchen asked, crossing her arms over her chest. Simply and clearly, one of Jurgen, Tess and Finn is not my biological child. Which one, I don't know, and I deliberately made it so as not to find out, because I don't want it to somehow affect my attitude towards them. But I know that for sure, I answered reservedly. Gretchen was shocked and speechless. If she wasn't a great actress, she herself was surprised about the paternity of one of our children. Bellows had to speak for her. How do you know? Bellows asked. DNA testing, I replied. Taking out another folder from my briefcase, I handed it to them. You can look at this for the next fifteen minutes, but you cannot copy it, and I will never provide you with a copy. I explained to them that I had specifically designed the request so that I would not know which child corresponded to each of the bottles a C. As Gretchen and Bellows read the report, she became increasingly depressed. After about ten minutes, they finished reading. I took back the DNA file, closed my briefcase, and said, Now you see, Gretchen dear, why there is no hope for reconciliation, why I left you in Woodstock to release a huge amount of boiling rage, and why you need to sign an agreement, a separation order included in the divorce papers, so that our sham marriage would end in a year. As I left, I heard Gretchen sobbing, I don't know if she was addressing Bellows or me, our marriage was not a sham. 
I closed the door and heard nothing more. Gretchen was a broken woman and signed the documents. However, this was far from the end of everything. Our children were upset, although I tried to put a positive spin on everything, even promising that Gretchen and I would have a friendly relationship and that we could celebrate holidays and important events together. Two months after my meeting with Gretchen and Bellows, I received an unexpected gift when Winston Tanran, judging by his breathing and slurred speech, fueled by alcohol, barged into my office, despite the protests of my secretary, and began screaming that I had ruined his life. Sending my small package to his wife and having several phone conversations with Melissa after that, I took this opportunity to beat him to a pulp. When paramedics and police arrived, his nose was smashed beyond recognition, and he was unable to have sex for a long time. Given my secretary's statement, the surveillance video of Winston breaking into the building and walking toward my office, and the doctor's report that Winston only suffered two blows, I was not held accountable. Unknown to Gretchen, her family attempted to stage an intervention with me, including offering mediation. Gretchen's father, Hans, was a proud Dutchman, and I was surprised that he would intervene, although we had always had a good relationship. However, Gretchen's mother, Lot, and her sister, Julia, were like pit bulls in trying to save the marriage, and I don't think they gave Hans the choice to skip the intervention. Shockingly, Julia's husband, Stan, also showed up. At least they had the courtesy to call ahead before coming to my house. I was polite and offered them drinks and cookies. I've always liked Hans, Lot and Julia not so much Stan, and I saw no reason to be rude to them unless things got out of hand. The conversation went as expected. Although everyone tried to be polite, at various points Lot and Julia shed a few tears, and Hans expressed his displeasure, albeit respectfully. At that time, I had absolutely no idea who the biological father of one of my children was. Considering the appearance of my children' hair color, eye color, height, etc., I honestly couldn't imagine anyone from our environment who could be a suspect. However, when Stan made that one rude comment and smirked, a light bulb went on in my head. Stan and Julia lived 20 miles away from us for about a year before Jurgen was born and before Finn was born when they moved hundreds of miles away. Although Gretchen had a complex and competitive relationship with Julia at the time which later became less complex and non-competitive after Stan and Julia moved in, she seemed just as indifferent to Stan as I was. I never saw any touching, looking, or personal interaction between them. But given what I knew about Gretchen now, it was possible that she slept with Stan as a way to one-up her sister. Although Stan had grown into a fat, stooped loser with prematurely gray hair on his balding head, at the time they lived near us he had blonde hair and was only two inches shorter than me. He had blue eyes. He wasn't ugly either his features weren't as refined as Gretchen's or mine, but he was good-looking enough and a good athlete. I zoned out for a while when this thought flashed through my head, but quickly returned to the conversation and continued to be even more polite to Lot. Julia and Hans. By the time they left, almost two hours after arriving, they realized that there was no hope for Gretchen and I to reunite, but that I would always love them and keep in touch, and hoped that we could celebrate some birthdays and holidays as before. I lied and told them I had no grudge against Gretchen, there just wasn't a spark and I was too young to live without love. At the last stage of negotiations before the final divorce, Gretchen and I were left with one controversial issue. He was more important to her than to me, but I thought I had already gone to more lengths than I should have. I finally told her, Okay, Gretchen, if you answer one question honestly, I'll give in to you and the matter will be over. She agreed. We let the lawyers leave the room. I asked her, Gretchen, have you ever slept with your brother-in-law, Stan? I could tell from her face and body language that the answer was yes, so I didn't really listen to what she said. I think it was something like, of course not, how could you ask such a disgusting question? But regardless of her verbal response, I was satisfied. I thanked her for her answer, apologized for the question, told the lawyers to give in to Gretchen, and even invited her to lunch. I only invited her to lunch because I knew she had a showing of the apartment right after we were done 
but I wanted to reassure her so she would think I believed her answer. She even smiled when I asked, politely declined and said, maybe another time, to which I falsely replied, of course, there will be time. I knew Stan would pay, but I didn't want Julia to get hurt, so my retribution had to be physical, not emotional or financial. About a year after I knew in my heart that Stan was the biological father of one of my children, the perfect situation arose. I learned from Finn that his uncle Stan was going fishing about a hundred miles from where I could justify my presence at the conference. I took my most trusted assistant to the conference, grabbed a disguise and a mask, asked the assistant to rent a car, and drove alone to Stan's fishing spot. After he went to sleep in his tent with his mask on, I taped his mouth shut, injected him with a muscle relaxant, dragged him out of the tent into the clearing without waking the rest of the camp, and beat him to a pulp. I poured a bottle of fire ants onto the wounds, whispered in his ear, you shouldn't have slept with other men's wives, and returned to the conference. They didn't even suspect me, and of course, Stan never repeated to anyone what I whispered in his ear. The other times he saw me after that, he looked at me strangely, but never said anything. Three years after the divorce was final, things went as expected. Gretchen and I, her family, and my family attended Jurgen and Tess graduations, were very friendly at Jurgen's wedding, and had a big celebration for Tess's 25th birthday. Gretchen also never told anyone about our children's DNA tests. Having gotten my revenge on Winston and Stan, and with no realistic chance of ever finding out about Gretchen's other affairs, I was content except for one thing. I never found a replacement for Gretchen. Although I dated quite a bit, and even hooked up a couple of times, I had not had any truly satisfying sexual experiences like the ones I had with Gina or with Gretchen when I started adding Alpha to her sherry, and not a single session like the ones we made love to Gretchen before I found out about her affairs. And then fate intervened. I was at a local trade show when a woman at one of the booths reminded me of Gina Martinelli. I was intrigued enough to say to her as the day ended, Excuse the staring, I know it's rude, but have you met Gina Martinelli? She blinked twice. This is my sister, although she is no longer Gina Martinelli. Now she is Gina Aliotto. Wait, you're not her little sister who sometimes looked after her kids in the summer and fall before she met Vince Aliotto. She smiled. It's me. Are you, by any chance, the big Dutchman with whom she lived one summer, and always bragged about your sexual exploits. I didn't know anything about bragging, but it certainly lifted my spirits. The same one, I laughed. Dirk Van Vliet, what's your name? My name is Gabriella. My last name is Martinelli again after my divorce four years ago, she answered with a smile that could light up the night. My thoughts immediately flashed back to my time with Gina. As far as I remembered, her sister was in high school when I was with Gina and looked a lot like her. This means that Gabriella is now around 46 or 47 years old, although, to be fair, she looked no older than 35. I got divorced three years ago, too. Can I invite you to dinner to talk? I asked. Not today, she replied with a smile. However, I'm a local I live in Arlington, and I'm free tomorrow night, and I'll be hungry then. Gabriella had almost the same magnetic sexual charm as her sister, and, fortunately, was much less volatile. We seemed to really hit it off. Her children were already out of college, and she had no real romantic interests. By the third date, I vowed to become such an interest. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one.